welcome back to the Yosan University 39 Gen podcast. We have an really, a really, really special guest with us today. Now, I don't need much introduction, but can you introduce yourself and tell people who you are and a little bit about、uh, your background? Oh, thank you, Sean.、Uh, yes,、um, I'm Dr. Mao Xing Ni.、Uh, most people know me by Dr. Mao. It's really funny, right?、Uh, when my brother and I, Dr. Dao,、uh, You know, a lot of people go, wait, wait, but you guys don't have the same last name.、Uh, are, you, are you really related? Yes, yes, we are. When we started out in our career some 40 years ago, our father was still in practice at the time. And so we were in the same practice together. So when pe- people call up and ask for Dr. Ni,、nee, that's our last name, Ni,、nee, um, there would be pandemonium because you know, we would know who they wanted to talk to or make an appointment with. So, Yeah. Uh, so, bottom line, we went to our first name. So, so Dr. Mao.、Um, I am,、uh, I've been steeped in this、uh, medicine for four years, and it's just been such a rewarding path,、uh, both on a clinical level, one on one with patients, as well as educating, training some really wonderful. I mean, you know, I have to say, like, all of our practitioners are fantastic. And, and there are some that are just amazingly achieved. And so、um, we're, we're just you know, humbled by just what,、uh, you know, what people can do when they put their mind and soul into pursuing something like China's medicine. It's amazing. And, and you know, you, you talk, do you mind sharing a little bit about your family tradition? Because, I mean, that, that's part of the name. The name for this podcast is the 39 Gin podcast because. You, your family has this long tradition that has now been handed down to so many of, of the students of Yosan. Can, can you share a little bit about your family background? Sure, sure.、Um, so the family lineage goes back 38 generations. We are the 38th、uh, generation. And so it's,、um, it's a long line of roughly 1,300 years in, in China. And、uh, so it's.、Um, You know, it, it, it's one of those things. I, I think in China, it, you, it's not surprising if, if a family will, will do something for you know, tens and twenties and thirty generations because that's traditional. You know, you just did what your、yeah. father did and it's got passed down. And,、uh, and people didn't move much, right? So they, you、yeah. know, that whole village b e c o m e populated with the same surname.、Yeah. Uh, so, I, I, I think it's one of those things. I didn't realize it until I got to America.、Uh, we, I came as a teenager from,、uh, I was born and raised in Taiwan. And,、uh, you know, when I got here, I didn't think much of like this you know, long tradition until someone pointed out, like, well, I don't even know who my great grandfather is. And I'm like, how can you not know your great grandfather? I mean, that's, that seems.、Uh, Blasphemous, you know, like、right. in, in the Chinese culture. I mean, you have to know every ancestor's name. I mean, we have the name of every ancestor going back 1300 years, right? Yeah. So,、um, so when we founded the school 30, 35, 36 years ago, we, we realized that, you know, what we need to do is pass this tradition on to the next generation, right? So that, therefore, the 39th generation, because You know, the, the medicine is incredible, but is, it's really、um, it's, it's, it's only as good as the individual who、um, decides to take on you know, the, 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 the mantle, if you will, and, and continue、yeah. the line, the tradition, right?、Uh, because instead of reinventing the wheel, which I think America is all about that, like, let's reinvent, right?、Yeah. We actually don't want to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> What you want to do is you want to take the wheel that was invented years ago, right?、Yeah. And make it better. Just keep、mm-hmm. improving on it. So incrementally, every generation gets better and better. So I tell my students, like, I want all of you to succeed way beyond what we've done, right? And I want、yeah. you to do the research. I want you to, you know,、uh, really take this medicine to its full potential.、Uh, I think we're just scratching the surface right now. And, and that's, you know, it's really beautiful. And it, it, it's spot on. Like,、um, it's interesting to think I, I do know myself as well.、Uh, you know, knowing the, the, the aunt, great grandpa, I, I have a, a photo of my great great grandpa 
And it was just like, you know, it's like 1800s. He's got early photographs and it's just, it seems, and that's only uh, three generations back, you know, and it's like beyond that is a mystery. And it, it's beautiful to have that, that understanding of the tradition. And, and it, as you move forward and, and there is this, th- th- as the students take on this mantle uh, moving forward, it's beautiful because, you know, I, I've seen so many of my classmates go on to do absolutely amazing things. And I, I think that it all comes back to that foundation, to that, to that starting point. How, how did you, you know, you grow up, you move from Taiwan to the U.S. At what point in time did you sit there and go, you know, this, this is the medicine I want to practice. This is what I want to be doing. Because, or was it always known? Or was there a point where you would sit there and say, I don't want to do that. And then it comes back around. No, so it's a great question, Sean. I, I was not the chosen one. Unfortunately, <laughs> I was born, you know, two years late. <laughs> right. So my brother, Dr. Dow, is, you know, he's the chosen one. Like, the oldest son gets to carry on the family tradition, right? Yeah. So I was left to my own device. But, you know, I kind of tagged along, right? Whatever training he was getting, I was getting, right? My father said, yeah. well... Since I'm going to train one, I might as well train two, right? <laughs> you know? So, you know, scale of e- uh, economy, right? So, yeah. Um, but my my actual moment came. It, it's 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 a really interesting thing. Why my brother didn't have a choice per se, I chose it. Yeah. And the reason is because I had fallen, you know, from three stories uh, when I was really? a kid. Oh yeah! Wow. Oh yeah! So, I, uh, I I was in a coma, and then uh, wow. when I woke up, I was paralyzed. I couldn't walk, and so and you know it's interesting. In those days, um, uh, anyway, going to the hospital was uh, w- was like dead sense. You, you wouldn't make it right from a traumatic yeah. brain injury. Uh, my father insisted on keeping me at home, which is kind of crazy. Uh, but he treated me. Um, and, uh, and, you know, when I, when I finally came to, and then, you know, I was not able to walk, he devised all kinds of contraptions to put me in like standing frames and treated me every day with acupuncture, fed me horrible tasting teas, herbal teas. And when my students or patients complained about how bad the herbs taste, I said, you haven't tasted bad herbs i mean like bad tasting herbs i have tasted every yeah. every bad tasting herbs there are out there um and but you know what the power of the medicine i mean i yeah. walked i was able to walk again and compete and became an athlete and i probably then you know overcompensated because i was so insecure about my inabilities right yeah. that um i i began to kind of i became a sports jock if you will so uh, so for me every doctor at the time basically wrote me off and said no he'll never walk again or he'll be a vegetable and whatever it might be but wow. my father of course knew better and he continued I never gave up right on me and and my mom took care of me so you know i i, I think <clears throat> for me, when when I became a teenager, you know, my father had asked me, like, well, what, what do you want to do? You know, because obviously, you know, my brother is going to be a doctor. What do you want to do? Yeah. And I looked at him and I said, I want to be a doctor, too, because uh, I want to show people, like, even when things are hopeless or dire, that there is still hope and then there is this innate healing uh, within you, and uh, we just need to learn how to awaken it. And and Chinese medicine and acupuncture and all the techniques that we have truly um, is a form of awakening to help awaken the body's healing yes. capabilities. And so, so for me, it was very personal. I chose it as opposed to okay, well, you got to do it, right? So yeah. Well, I, I love that's awesome. I didn't, so I'd never heard that story. It's really powerful to hear how it, you know the medicine found you. But I, I love the 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 point, and you know, I think that you you really hit on an important point that a lot of people sit there and come to acupuncture that don't understand it and go, "Well, how does this work? You're putting these needles in there. Is it magic? Is it you know?" And then it it really is our 
awakening and, and helping our body open up its own healing potential. You know, it, there is, it is a masterfully uh, developed machine, this body, and it has such powerful healing potential. But, you know, sometimes it has to be kickstarted. It has to be reminded that it can do this. There was um, a, a, in university, I went and I watched this professor he came to my school and he was one of the world experts on stress and they did all these tests on, on, on uh, animals in, in, in like giving these animals stress. And what they found was these animals would develop these horrible conditions and so sad, so horrible. But what they found when they removed the stress is that the animal's bodies had the ability to heal. So they were creating by giving these animals human level stresses and like um, simulating our modern society car horns and you know things that were going on this disharmony was created you know they were suddenly knocked out of balance but when balance was allowed to return the the organisms were able to respond to that with their own in, innate healing ability and it just reminded me of that when you were saying that well the magic is you know with it Really, ultimately, right? And uh, so that's really, truly what the medicine's about. I, you know, I wanted to kind of compare, like, Western medicine, it's like, let me do it for you. Yeah. Chinese medicine is, let me empower you to do it for you. Yeah. So I liken it to give a man fish, you know, he will eat for three days. Yeah. Teach him how to fish, he will be self-sustainable for life, right? And uh, so what we want to do is awaken each patient's inner healing capability and then empower them with the knowledge and say to them, you are in charge of your body, your health, your life, and go do it. And uh, instead of, you know, relying and dependent on, um, you know, a, a system, a, a, a Medicine and you know and it's it's interesting because I, I know you know healthcare is just like any any other profession is a profession right so you need patients to um, you know to have your business but my motto has always been treat the patients get them well get them out the door as quickly as you can yes because every patient who gets well and feels good about being empowered will refer three other patients. Yeah. And so I've, you know, that's, that served me for my entire career. Never had to worry about patient or promotion or anything of that nature. Just get the patient well quickly, you know? Yeah. And, um, so anyway, it's the proof is ultimately in the pudding. So hundred percent. How did your family's approach to Chinese medicine and Taoism differ from mainstream practices? And how, how did things, how did that shape your path going forward? Well, you know, I, I think the, the important thing is uh, what I learned very early on is, is the Taoist philosophy of balance. I mean, if you think about it from, you know, perspective, right, is that, um, for example, sports, right? Yeah. So, People will go out and train like crazy and to the point of exhaustion and injuring themselves. Mm -hmm. Our family has always promoted like, listen, um, you need to uh, train for sure. You know, like, um, you know, I was, I was playing volleyball. I was playing dodgeball and, and little league baseball. Right. So growing up. Right. So, and yeah. then martial arts, but, but, um, but he's not doing a lot of practice. It was, it was also like, you need to get plenty of rest. You need to eat yeah. well. You need to, um, you know, sort of meditate visualization techniques and various mm -hmm. things. So anyway, it's, um, it's, it's really about balance. And so, so that's why when I started my career, I, I just remember that vividly, plus my own personal experience. I don't want to be treating patients forever, right? Meaning, yeah. if you got a condition, our goal is to help you get well and then teach you how to stay well. Yeah. And so education has always been a big piece of what we do. And, uh, and you know, and, and this is, like I said earlier, right? This is contrary to a lot of people 
thinking about building practices. They're thinking about, well, I'll just have patients come once a week or twice a week, whatever, for as long as, you know, they can afford to do that. And uh, for us, it's always been no, but our job is to get them well and get them on their way. Uh, because ultimately, uh, we that'll create more room for other patients, right? Because that's yeah. really the key. Uh, and uh, so I, I, I guess, you know, from that perspective, it's, it's really, um, you know, if, if you perform your good deeds, you know, you will be rewarded. And, um, and Taoism, you know, Taoism teaches really about, um, I mean, it teaches so, so many things, but it teaches you to become aware of how to stay in harmony with mm-hmm. nature, with life. And so that's something that I've taken to heart as well, uh, you know, early on is to learn how to really stay in harmony. Like, you know, when the weather changed, seasonal changes, we would have all kinds of things that we would do to prepare in order to adapt. And uh, so harmony is a pretty big um, practice within our family. So I love that. Well, there's, there's two things that you, you unpacked, but I want to, I want to, I want to look at one of them as you speak about education and, you know, as a, as a student of a school that you and your brother founded, uh, what inspired you to, to create Yosan? Well, that was very simple because, um, when we started out, we were, we wanted to teach, yeah. um, but we didn't have our school. So we went to teach at other schools. And we would have suggestions for the other schools. You know, you guys should make improvements about this and that. <laughs> yeah. You know, n- nothing would ever change. And yeah. so at some point, my brother and I decided, like, you know, we got frustrated. It just, the, the program we were teaching just weren't very good. So we said, well, let's, let's start. And we already had a foundation because predecessor to, Yosan University was College of Tao and Traditional Chinese Healing. I mean, that's what it was called. My yeah. father had brought that from China to, to Taiwan, from Taiwan to the U.S. back in 1975. <clears throat> so he had ran that school for about five, six years. Right. Uh, and we graduated a couple classes uh, of, you know, and, and these, you know, veterans were the ones that went out, meaning veterans of our profession, went out and really created, you know, sort of this wave of change in the beginning. And so, um, so yeah, so then what happened was he got way too busy and was doing all by himself. And so he closed it down. And then so by 1989, my brother and I were ready. We said, "Okay, let's let's start the school." Uh, and uh, but you know, College of Tao really was very focused on all the other Taoist arts and sciences. Uh, yeah. And believe it or not, there's like the eight pillars of Taoism, and Chinese medicine is one of the pillars, right? Yeah. So we said, "Okay," because of accreditation, because of all the you know, legal issues, we have to spin that out and have you know have it out as its own medical school, right? Just focus on just training students on TCM and acupuncture. So, and so we did that in 89, but we had a foundation to start with because again, our father had already a school uh, prior in the late seventies. And it's, it's interesting because I, I, uh, as a student, one of the things that drew me to Yosan was the chi development. Why did where was the inspiration to say, hey, you know what, our students need to be practicing this themselves? Um, it's it's really such an essential part of developing yourself as a practitioner because, you know, after all, we work with chi, right? I mean, yeah. you learn from day one, like chi, energy, life force. I mean, this is what we're working with. And uh, so if you don't understand how to work with it within you, uh, then it's hard to really, you know, kind of achieve the kind of results that you're looking for with your patients. So we feel, and through our own personal experience as well, that 
practice Qigong and Tai Chi and meditation and Taoing yoga and other practices within our tradition uh, prepared you to become, number one, much more sensitive and aware of the patient on subtle levels. You can tell when a patient walks in, um, already you can, you can sort of sense where the problem is and what's wrong because of your practice. You refined yourself to the point of having aware, acute awareness and sensitivity to, to detect where the issues are and so forth. So a lot of times people may just not tell you what the issues are, but you feel innately. Yeah. And as you are working with needles, you are also putting your chi into the patient in order to affect a change. Uh, and oftentimes you can also do the same without the needle, just by, yeah. you know, infusing chi into someone and activating their own innate healing capabilities. And so, um, so the more you develop yourself as a practitioner, the better you are as a doctor. And that's hundred percent the case. That's, that's powerful. And, and this leads to my next question. Like how, how do you handle stress and, and, and prevent burnout and, 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 enhance your own uh, wellness while handling so many responsibilities and having patience? Well, so, <laughs> you know, healer must heal thyself. And uh, yeah. so I, I have had a good foundation, right? So I'm lucky yeah. that way. So that means I get up and I go outside and, you know, before I even get out of bed, I'm doing my stretching, my dowing practices, in bed on the floor, get up, and then I go out and do my Tai Chi, my Qigong. Uh, and, and I live, my backyard is Topanga State Park, so I'm lucky that I, I live in nature, right? And so I've, I've got access to beautiful trees and environment. So I, I do my practices, and I go for a walk, and, uh, and then I meditate. So even, it's interesting. People go, yeah, I know, I, I try to get to it, whatever it is. Even in between patients, if I have a moment of a few minutes, I sit quietly and I meditate. And I try to gather my chi and my spirit because, you know, you get frazzled because pe people are pulling you left and right. And, yeah. and yes, stress is a real thing. But even just a few minutes, the deep yeah. breathing, the mind uh, visualization, the calming, um, you know, invocations. I mean, there are so many things you can do and it doesn't take a lot of time. Five minutes is good enough. So yeah. that's beautiful. Well, one of the things that you, you spoke about earlier and, and talking about the building of a business, you know, you had said that I know that a lot of people sat there, I want to get this, develop this patient and keep them for as long as I can. I, I love to hear this, this idea of helping people, empowering people to get better and then knowing that they will bring other people back in, that's that's an awesome perspective. And what was the uh, most significant turning point that helped your business grow? And how did you handle it? Um, well, Sean, it's a, it's it's a it's a very um, astute question. Um, okay, so let, let's talk about the most powerful marketing. The most, most powerful marketing is word of mouth. Yeah. People giving testimonial to another person about how they have experienced the healing, right? Yeah. So the, the testimonial is from their experience, but it's also from engagement. So one of the things you have to do, right, is you, you find touch points to engage your patient. So someone comes in and they say, oh, doc, uh, what should I eat? What should I not eat? And so forth. This person is really interested in diet, right? Nutrition. So you engage them on that level and says, oh, I'm so glad you asked. Let me explain to you what you can do to help facilitate and speed up your healing process. Here's a list of do's and don'ts of foods, right? Mm -hmm. um, are you interested in more, right? Of course, Maybe you can work on a menu plan for me. 
well, I'm happy to do a, a nutritional consultation, a personalized menu plan for you. So I would sit down, I would plot out a menu plan, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and snacks in between. And I even, you know, include recipes and so forth. And, uh, and so next time I'm engaged with a patient, they're so happy because I've provided them with this thing. <clears throat> and then uh, now they're also, they've taken a, a bigger ownership of their health because they're now doing something for themselves, right? Yeah. And, uh, and, and it happens to be something you're really interested in, food, let's say. Um, and so whatever it may be, whether it's food, whether it's exercise, so some, let's say I had, um, so the tennis channel had me on uh, once uh, doing Tai Chi, teaching Tai Chi to tennis players. Tai Chi for tennis, right? So. <laughs> So I'll have a tennis player come in and they keep straining their, you know, like say hamstrings and so forth or Achilles and so forth. I, so then I will teach them a few exercises from Tai Chi, some moves and so forth and get them interested. And then, um, and then they want to know more and more it says, okay, let, let's work on your Tai Chi. You know, let's meet for half an hour once a week and let's work on Tai Chi. So, all right, so I'm engaging a patient more than just the healing. The healing is already taking place, and they are, yeah. you know, the actual treatment itself. You know, I don't need to be putting needles in them. I can show yeah. them how to move correctly during their tennis play so that they can avoid straining that area again, right? And uh, so if you can equip yourself with as much knowledge as possible. This is one of the exciting things we have at Yosan is we're looking to see how we can do, let's say, TCM physiotherapy, right? We have our own yeah. physiotherapy, but we're not using it and we're not yeah. actually bringing it into the clinical setting. But we should because yeah. you've learned the Tai Chi, the Qigong and all that. Now you just have to learn how to apply that to every condition that you see clinically. So, Engage patients where they are at. That's really yeah. important. Now the next thing happens naturally is you engage, you, you become friends. And what, what do friends do? Friends tell other people yeah. about, you know, let me tell you about my friend. I mean, he's not only a doctor of Chinese medicine and he treats me with acupuncture and gives me these horrible tasting tea and all that, but he also... He's coaching me on Tai Chi. He's coaching me on meditation or he's working with my diet. He's, and next thing you know, you've got your, like, like the whole friend group coming to yeah. see you. I mean, it's, I will tell you, it's not difficult to build a practice. It, it's, it's actually quite easy. You just have to invest the time and energy in truly become interested in people. Yeah. engage them where they're at and find solutions for them and they will be they will be your advocate for life i, I had the fun experience of this summer um i i got to work with uh, community management for uh, mel robbins the podcaster for her team and so i got to do all of the her her team's community management uh, not, I was one of the team in the community management. And what was interesting is that uh, in the beginning of the summer, we were working with this community and it was a bunch of individuals. And by the end of this, of this, of this project that we worked with her on, it was this, this community. It was truly a community where people came together and you know, in, in the beginning, we were the ones that would put the comments out. We were the ones supporting people. We were the ones doing the nurturing. But over the course of this time, the community developed this, this literal community. And they were the ones, you know, preaching the, the, the word of, of positivity or whatever it was that we had been sharing. And one of the things that I have always been amazed by that you and your brother were able to do was the community that you built around the school, not just the school, but the co community around the school, around your personal practice. Because we would always see events where you would have these people coming in and speaking and they spoke. And the first thing they would always say is that, you know, I had been dealing with this and Dr. Mao and Dr. Dow helped me get better. And that was, that was, 
the foundation, the foundation of being able to give these people health created this, 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 um, I don't want to say belief, but just appreciation, love and, and, uh, and sense of community in this healing space. And it was, it's powerful to see that. And as, as your practice, and I, I've been associated with the school for a while now, as I've s- s- spent in that time to see more and more people joining that community and it continues to grow. And I see the community growing as all the students spread the community outward. It, it's a powerful path. Now, how important has community been in your journey and, and beyond just helping people get better? How do you build those connections? Well, community is essential, right? Because we don't exist in a vacuum. You could. I mean, the ancient Taoists uh, prefer to spend time in the mountains right. <laughs> than with people. Uh, they were mostly avoiding political persecution. But anyway, uh, but it's... Um, we are we we are social creatures we need to we need each other that's the reality right yeah. i mean i'm always reminded of this uh you know orphans who do not get interaction yeah. uh, from somebody uh they don't thrive they, there's there's a term called failure to thrive they just simply don't thrive and they they could end up with disease and die and so forth but if you know little babies get lots of interaction from people and so forth then they really thrive they perk up and so forth i mean just thinking from that perspective like we need energy from one another right we need the interaction so community is so key to doing anything i used to think i can do everything myself uh and then I'm always humble that, no, I need help. Yeah, right. <laughs> I need help. So right. ask people for help. And, and don't be afraid. To, this is the one thing I always tell my students. Like when, you, when, when the patient comes back and says, Doc, my back feels so much better after your last treatment, take that compliment. Thank you so much for letting me know. I really appreciate it. And I would really appreciate if you can tell your other friends and family members who have back pain that i can help them right just yeah. you know i would appreciate a referral or two or three just ask for it because sometimes people need to be reminded like hey listen you know and so you start to build a community it could start small and pretty soon you go you know you you broaden your your reach and 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 the thing is give of yourself right just that's how you build community like roll up your sleeves raise your hands volunteer get into a group right i don't care what group it is go and volunteer and let people get to know you you get to know people next thing they know is oh you do acupuncture you do chinese medicine i've been thinking or my 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 mother was asking me the other day, does she you know do I know someone who does acupuncture? You just be out there, right? And uh, yeah. and, and be in the community. And so, the community is is so key to um, building a successful, not just profession, but your life really, because that's you know we are very much localized in who we interact with. Totally true. It reminds me of, I saw this video the other day on this podcast about success. And it was this guy who was starting a new company. And he had, it was, it was a very interesting concept. They made silicone rings for like wedding bands. And, and the idea was that people didn't want to wear, these guys didn't want to wear a a metal wedding ring to the gym or things because it would be painful. And so they said, Hey, I have active lifestyle. And I, yet I also want to show people my, my, my commitment to my spouse. So I'm going to wear this ring. And what's interesting is that in the beginning, they dumped all this money into getting their product. And then the product came back and it wasn't, wasn't great. So they had to get, you know, I, I or eyebrow scissors and, and trim every last ring to make it look right. They dumped a bunch of money into it and they were like, I don't know how we're going to succeed. And they just, this guy said, well, he had this idea. One of his college friends, uh, her, her husband was 
the quarterback of a football team. And so he sent her a message. He's like, you know what? Not asking for anything, but might your husband, you know, might you and your husband want one of these because, you know, he's on the field and you can't wear a, fo- a wedding band. And she said, yeah, send it over. He, he would love it. And so he sent it and nothing happened. <laughs> and he was just like, okay, okay, thanks. You know, and the guy wore it. And six months later, there's this special on TV and they're interviewing the football player. And the whole time he's talking about, you know, this, this silicon wedding band that he's wearing. And just like that, it just, their business took off. And the idea was that he, he actually, you know, of course he was hoping this guy might go and say something, but he let it go. He was tapping his community, shared something of value. Here is something that I have created of value. I am providing you that thing of value. And then he let it go. And planted that seed, gave it time, and at the right time, it, it grew. And you know that's part of the beauty of community is we are planting these seeds, constantly planting these seeds. And they're not seeds of asking people to market for us. It's just I'm planting a seed of giving you something of value, bringing your health. And in time, that will nurture. And that's the beauty of community is that you know you are not the only person planting those seeds you plant the seeds initially and then these other people begin to plant the seeds for you and it just grows well put excellent story sean now let me ask you this talking and switching into part of the beauty of of yosan right now is it has such a powerful integrative medicine approach Uh, what do you believe are the biggest misconceptions about tcm in the modern healthcare setting and, and how can we address those yeah well one of the biggest misconceptions you know is that chinese medicine is outdated or you know yeah. lack scientific backing right because that's the sort of what western mds usually discount chinese medicine in reality right i mean tcm has been used not just thousands of years but there are thousands of studies just this last weekend we had our integrative medicine clinical medicine symposium at yosan and saturday was devoted to integrative oncology mm-hmm. and i quoted uh the fact is there are 20,000, oh, more than 20,000 studies on acupuncture and TCM on cancer published in the wow. PubMed. It's available. It's over 20,000 studies. So it's, um, you know, one of the things that the misconception comes from a lack of knowledge. It's just people don't know. We need to get the message out there, right? It's yeah. so we need to get that message out there through education, through further collaboration, working alongside Western medicine professionals, providing evidence based research. For example, you know, we can show how this complementary approach combining both TCM and Western medicine in an integrated fashion can be so much more beneficial for patients than just alone, right? Doing one alone. And uh, so I I think that's really important. And and in order to have effective collaboration, and this is the thing that I want to emphasize, both my brother and I have been trained in Western medicine. You know, we, we, we learn enough Western medicine, but we also went to schools, medical schools in China, and really brushed up on our Western medicine. So that when we came back to the States, uh, we are able to collaborate and speak the language. I mean, because, you know, you have to, TCM practitioner, you have to be able to understand the language and the methodologies of Western medicine so that we can then speak like colleagues, right? Yeah. Because they're not going to understand when you start talking about indeficiency of kidney or chi yeah. deficiency of spleen, what is that in Western medicine? You have to think of it from that perspective. You know, I, you know, the, the one thing I, I, I always use as an example is <clears throat> what is liver yang rising, right? So yeah. we say liver yang rising starts with liver 
stagnation, which over time turns into young rising, right? And that and the and the outlook is is someone who's a bit manic, right? I mean, they're a little uh, nutty and rage and so forth and agitated. Well, I mean, in Western medicine, this is pretty. I mean, pretty simple in that way, right? We can we can look at the cause of this. This person has been under a lot of stress, right? Which yes. is liver stagnation. He's I'm using he, but yeah. it can certainly happen to to women as well. But he's been producing cortisol in his body from the stress, so we, yeah. we can agree on that, right? So he's been pumping cortisol. Cortisol is the same molecule as cortisone or prednisone, steroid. Mm-hmm. So let's assume that you're taking 10 milligrams of prednisone every day, okay? Mm. Which is what you're producing yourself. Yeah. Over time, what do you think is going to happen to you? You're going to be manic. You're going to be you going to be impossible to deal with someone who's on steroids bouncing off the wall and everything. And so if you're able to understand the mechanism and communicate in a you know, physiological, pathophysiological way. Uh, that's understandable. So when we talk about in TCM to soothe the liver and to subdue the liver young, we literally are using herbs that help the liver detoxify the cortisol out of the body. Mm. I mean, there's actual studies and mechanisms that show this is exactly what happens. And with acupuncture, you can flip a switch and take someone from sympathetic overdrive back to parasympathetic by stimulate by activating the vagus nerve. We can do all of this. It's all scientific if you care to understand it. But, you know, Western medicine, the doctors themselves are so busy, and they may not be interested so much that they will also go and do their own research. But you have to educate them. You have to explain. You have to talk to them and collaborate. That's how this will be able to dispel the misconception. Now, there's always going to be detractors, of course, uh, but we go we go with the war market. We, you yeah. know, there are tons of patients. I, I, mean, I mean, let me just ex- explain. I mean, over the weekend, we had a handful of medical doctors presenting, and they are MDs who have little to no knowledge of Chinese medicine, but yet they really uh, appreciate our ability to articulate the science behind it, and then also the cross-pollinization, because we understand Western medicine. We understand when we talk about cancer and, you know, the mechanism of cancer and the the pathology behind it and how to resolve it. We're not rejecting Western medicine. We're saying, look, let's take this other piece, patient's quality of life, neutropenia, you know, um, low blood, you know, white blood cells or anemia, bone marrow insufficiency. I mean, there's all kinds of things, nausea, neuropathy. We can help, right, besides mm-hmm. also enhancing your cancer treatments, anti-cancer treatments. So so that's really the key. You have to really be able to um, integrate both sides. I love that. Uh, are there any, any particular conditions or treatments where you've seen – TCM Excel beyond what modern medicine typically offers or where, and I, I don't want to make it this us versus them or where they in concert, they, they get a better result when they are used together. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I think if you think of it, right, this is the common knowledge, right? Western medicine is great for acute care, acute care. Yeah. I mean, look, you get hit by a car or if you, and whatever, uh, you broke a bone, you need acute, uh, you need surgery right away. It's, it's superb. Technology is amazing, right? If you have yeah. cancer that needs to be cut out, um, do it, right? Don't wait. Yeah. I mean, don't don't sit and wait for Chinese medicine to dissolve the tumor because it might have spread, right? So, but in particular, TCM excels in treating chronic disease because chronic yeah. disease Western medicine relies on just medication. And we all know that there's lots of side effects. One medication leads to another, right? Uh, mm-hmm. The condition. And then also managing stress, anxiety, and digestive disorder and cancer support. I'll, I'll give you an example of digestive uh, uh, disorder. It's a very common condition called SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. 
tons of people walk around bloated, ghastly all the time. They have bloat, uh, you have constipation and maybe diarrhea. And they go to their gastro. Gastro gives them very med- various medication. It doesn't really help. <clears throat> they come to us. And in TCA, we go, wow, you know what? You've got spleen t- t- efficiency. You have yep. dampness, right? You have liver stagnation. Let's help you address it all. The liver stagnation has to do with stress management. Okay, good. Spleen deficiency, dampness, that has to do with your diet. Let's really get that straightened up and let's clean up your flora. And there may be a little damp pee we need to clear first. Once we're done, their SIBO goes away. And they go, my God, I've been suffering with this for 20 years and my gastro yeah. just gives me pills. It doesn't really help me. And here we are. We're getting at the root of it, right? As opposed to just you know, band-aid approach, symptomatic relief, right? And so I, I think these are things that, you know, again, that's where TCM excels at. Now, where the integration truly shines is in cancer, for example, right? Because yeah. Western medicine practices what we call chu uh, which is expel evil factors, which are basically cancerous factors. Uh, TCM practices fu zheng, Fu zheng is to support the righteous qi, right? You yeah. support optimum function. Basically, that's what it is. So, and what we do is we preserve the patient's health while Western medicine is killing the cancer. Yeah. The collaboration is beautiful, and uh, we get better results, better outcome in terms of you know the cancer survival rate and all that, uh, and cure rates. So. Uh, more and more, I, I think in all areas you know, that we, we need to collaborate. And, uh, and that's the way of the future. You know, patients are the beneficiary of this collaborative effort, and we owe it to them. If you had one chance to kind of go back and uh, learn something differently or to give yourself, your younger self, some advice in this journey, what, what advice would you give yourself on this journey? Uh Sean, it's, it's, that's a right. good one. You know, 40 years later, right? I look back and there are lots of areas that I, you know, I, I could have done differently and improved. I would, I would say to my younger self, don't be in such a hurry. Yeah. <laughs> right. Right. Because, uh, in the process of just hurrying, I, you know, I, I, I was a, I was a young man, uh, on a mission. Yes. And uh, I was extremely achievement oriented, and uh, and I, I really feel that has costed me a lot mm-hmm. in terms of my well being, in terms of my relationship with my family, and you know that I mean again, there's something that's got to give, right? Yeah. And so if I would do it over again, I or tell my younger self, like, listen, like. Just you have this long life, right? Just pace yourself, uh, you know, and and take care of yourself. Really, that's really key. We have to practice the medicine ourselves on yes. us. So, yeah. uh, so don't forget that. You know, you you have to be, you almost have to be exemplary for your patient. Like, how are you going to tell patients stop smoking when you're off smoking? Right. So, in other words. You have to embody the principle mm-hmm. of Chinese medicine and Taoism. You know, it's all about really, you know, well-being, harmony, balance. And I have to admit, Sean, I, I was not always balanced. Uh, I strive yeah. for it, you know. But, um, but no, I, I, if I do it again, I, I definitely would – take my time and smell the roses along the way right not be in such a rush anyway i love that good question Uh, how how do you integrate mindfulness practices and meditation into your daily life and what impact has it had on your well-being oh it's it's extremely important and critical Uh, if you're not mindful you're just moving you know, moving through life uh, unconsciously, uh, you know, just doing the motions. It's, it's completely meaningless. Mindfulness gives me meaning to what I do. So I'm aware of why I'm doing yeah. what I'm doing. 
And that makes all the difference because, you know, at the end of it, we have, you know, I hope we all have a hundred years yeah. to live out our purpose, our dreams and our aspirations. And, uh, but to be very mindful of, are you doing, you know, what you came to do? I think that's really important. So, uh, anyway, so the mindfulness practices that I do, I try to do it on a regular basis any time of the day. Like I said, in between patients, I would center myself and, you know, get into it. And then when I'm with patients, you know, with patients is really kind of amazing because you will find yourself 100%. You have to be focused and be mindful at that moment with your patient. Otherwise, yeah. you're going to miss something. Yeah. And uh, so, so the practice of medicine is a mindfulness practice in itself. But then when you go away from your clinic and into your life and out into the world, being mindful can help you avoid having to double back. Yeah. And I've doubled back way too many times to, you know, uh, you know, it's like, don't, don't, if you can help it, right. Sometimes you can't help it. Yeah. But if you're mindful, you can avoid a lot of unnecessary expenditure of your chi, your life force. And after all, we have limited, I mean, yeah. unlimited, but limited, right? We say yeah. jing, which is the essence. It's, 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 you know, your, your finite amount, right? That's your lifespan. But we can, um, we can decide about our health span, our quality. And that's when mindfulness really makes all the difference. There was um, the Vietnamese Buddhist uh, monk who talked about, he once gave a man, a, I believe, an apricot and told him, here, eat the apricot. And the man was like, all right, eating the apricot and trying to carry on a conversation. And he's like, you're not enjoying your apricot. You know, and it was just like that, that moment of if you can be present and whatever it is and wherever you're at, the universe opens itself up to you. you know, that's the beauty of it all. Well, trust me, my kids remind me of that when I'm not present. They go, Dad, <laughs> you're not here with us. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I go, busted, sorry. <laughs> I love that. Anyway. Well, I, if you could give uh, one last bit of advice to Yo San students as they head out into this profession, what would that be? Work on yourself. Uh, I always uh, say that the medicine is truly unfathomable. I mean, the potential of it is so great, but it's only as good as you. Yeah. And so besides sharpening your skills and acquiring, you know, more knowledge, the most important thing you can do is work on yourself spiritually, emotionally, physically, whatever it might be. You embody the medicine. Patients respond to you. Yeah. They respond to who you are. They respond to your energy. You don't even have to say anything. You just have to just be with them. That's it. And they feel it. And something starts to change in a very positive way. So work on yourself. Don't stop. Don't stop doing that. And 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 I invite all of you to check out our, you know, our other college, right? College of Tao, the predecessor to Yosan University. Yeah. Uh, college of that org we have so many online classes if you are interested in feng shui or health coaching life coaching different you know things that you can work on but a, a, at the end of the day when you learn all of these things you learn to apply them to yourself yeah. and that's the beauty of it so